I want to invite you now to take out your teaching outlines. And I have to tell you, when I do these message series, um, when you come to the end of it, you're like, great, I, I can't wait to do something else, you know? Um, not the Bible, of course, but you, know, you, you want to go through a new theme. Man, I don't want to stop this theme of sowing and reaping. Because that, this is what life is. This is very practical for you and I. We sow what we reap. We reap what we sow. It's vital to our understanding. And today I'd like to talk with you about what I believe is medicine for the soul, and that is thankfulness. I want to talk with you about sow thankfulness, reap wholeness. Can you say that with me? Sow thankfulness, reap wholeness. Uh, there is something of completion that happens within ourselves, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, when we are a thankful people. And we want to sow seeds that lead to wholeness, and that happens to be through thankfulness. Now, when it comes to being thankful, to having a, an attitude of gratitude, if you will, um, what I'd like to talk first about is, what, a, what are some of the reasons for ingratitude, okay? The first one is a sour attitude. Can you say that with me? Sour attitude. Oh, attitudes, right? You know, when you think about your attitude, when you have a problem in life, your problem really isn't your problem. Your problem could be your attitude. It's how you're perceiving it. So problems uh, are going to happen in life. Your attitude helps you attack your problems. In fact, your, your attitude is your best weapon in your arsenal against your problems. Uh, your attitude is also your best friend with your perspective. And if you can have a healthy perspective in Almighty God, it could help you with your ability to be thankful. But when you're sour all the time, you look at thankfulness as you know, just something that gets in the way. And we have that kind of grouchy, um, Scrooge spirit, not just in December, but all throughout the year. Now, how many of you have seen the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving? Ever seen that before? Okay. It was released on November 20th, 1973. By the way, I think they're going to show it the, the day before Thanksgiving, okay? So free information here at church, right? Now, you remember that episode of the classic. Uh, everybody's kind of a uh, uh, kind, kind of has their, their wires mixed up with Thanksgiving. But Charlie Brown is very negative about Thanksgiving right now. And there's, there's some reason for that. Peppermint Patty, which by the way, what a cool name that is. Peppermint Patty just keeps inviting people to, to Charlie Brown's house. And they're not even going to be home. So that's kind of a problem. And so she keeps inviting people, you know, Marcy, Franklin, everybody's joining. And Peppermint Patty says, you know, you're going to be happy to have me. She kind of has that domineering spirit. Okay, and so now you have Peppermint Patty and Marcy and Lucy coming over, and Linus, though, says, you know, don't be down about things. Remember, our country was the first country to, uh, you know, make Thanksgiving a holiday, and then some words of wisdom were given to good old Charlie Brown, and um, it comes from Marcy, and she said, uh, Thanksgiving is more than eating, Chuck, because he was worried about cooking the bird and all that. She said, uh, you heard what Linus was saying here, that those pilgrims were thankful for what they had, and uh, that we should be thankful too. We should be thankful for being together. I think that's what they mean by thanksgiving, Charlie Brown. And, you know, she was trying to help his sour attitude. You know, do you have a sour attitude? If you do, it's going to get in the way of you being thankful about God, about life, about the blessings that you have. Here's another reason for ingratitude. Self-absorbed. We live in a culture today that it really, it's all about me. It's what I'm going to get out of a situation, what I'm going to get out of a person. Um, and that self-absorbed mentality blocks our vision of the blessings God has given to us. Here's another one, spiritual amnesia, okay? Now, you've heard of amnesia before. Amnesia could be caused by some type of brain damage or disease, and it, it impairs the brain to be able to uh, remember properly. Well, we could get spiritual amnesia where our soul is blocked, and uh, we are forgetting the blessings of God. Um, and it, it could be because of some confusion we have. It could be because of some disease of selfishness that we have. But we get spiritual amnesia. And then here's probably the biggest one, sinful acceptance. When I allow, listen, we're all going to sin. But when I accept sin as being okay in my life, when I think it's okay to do what I want to do and not what God wants to do, when I accept those uh, mentalities in my life, it, without question, blocks my understanding, my memory, and my view of God's blessings. And so these are all reasons for ingratitude. And so then let's see, what do we have to sow to have 
the type of thankfulness that will yield a wholeness in our life. Now, to illustrate that for you, I want to invite you to turn with me to the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And Dr. Luke is going to include a miracle here that, you know, this really reads like a parable. It's a true story, but it reads like a parable. Um, And it's an incredible story, and you may have heard of it before, the story of the ten lepers. And we know just by the term leprosy that right off the top, you know how severe, medically speaking, it was to have leprosy. And so here we're going to encounter ten lepers. Jesus is going to encounter ten lepers. And as we read through this amazing story, uh, we're going to get, I believe, a handle on how to sow thankfulness. So let's start off here in verse 11. It says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along Samaria and Galilee. Verse 12, as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers. Now, pause it right there. This was common. As you would enter a city gate, there would be beggars there, people who are in extreme conditions of poverty, looking for help. There would be people who had um, emotional crisis. And yes, there were people who had physical crisis. Lepers. Uh, Lepers, as we know, um, to have leprosy in in this day and any day prior to this, uh, the Jews, the religious leaders, called it the finger of God. That God was judging you because this was a death sentence. If you had leprosy, uh, once it was pronounced... See, when you you and I get sick and you might have have a bruise on your leg, you don't even know how it got there. it's, It's a bruise, okay? Um, But then maybe something else shows up, and then something else shows up. You know, you might go to Dwayne Reed, okay, and get get cream. Or you might go to a doctor. If you started to see spots and sores that weren't healing, you didn't go to Dwayne Reed. They didn't have Dwayne Reed, and they didn't even have CVS. Imagine that. What they had to do was they had to go to the priest. And the priest would say something, and when these words would fall from his lips, it, it, it changed your life. That if you were declared to have leprosy, you were now separated from your family. You couldn't, you couldn't hug your children anymore, your spouse. Uh, there were no more birthdays. You, if your, your mother or father died, you couldn't go to their funerals. You were separated from them. You had to keep their distance because they didn't want you infecting anybody else. It was physically damning as well as spiritually damning. And so these ten lepers are in a state of desperation. Now, uh, the Bible has much to say about leprosy. Notice the next part says, it says, they stood at a distance. They stood what? At a distance. Now, uh, we find out by studying ancient history, uh, looking at Leviticus 13, 14, other places in the Bible, that if you had leprosy and there was a downward wind, you stood 50 paces away. If there was an upward wind, you stood 100 paces away. And if anybody came near to you, you would yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. And so this was a, a social stigma as well, as well as an illness. Um, It was terrible to have leprosy. It was, as I mentioned earlier, a death sentence. And so the scene is set. Jesus is entering this area. Ten lepers. And now, verse 13, they lifted up their voice. Now, this is a nice way for saying they were screaming. Now, you know, when you watch the movies about Jesus, right? Not the Passion of the Christ, but when you watch the movies about Jesus, for some reason, they hire all these like England actors or, or Australia actors. Now, nothing wrong with those folks. They're great actors. But I don't think the people of Jesus' day yelled out to Jesus, uh, hey, lad, or hey, uh, you know, it's me. You know, I don't think they did that. Um, they were screaming. They were in pain. And the reason why that they're lifting their voice and what they're about to ask, again, is this is how we're to pray, by the way. It represents their state of desperation but it also represents something else. And that is this, is that they must have gotten wind that this carpenter from Galilee is a miracle worker. There's something in the wind here that's different because up until this point, they had no hope. You have to understand something. They wouldn't even bother to ask for help if, if they didn't think, if there wasn't even a little bit of hope that this carpenter from Galilee can help them. Because this is different than blindness. This is different than being crippled. This this is a debt sentence. You have to understand that. So now it says this. They lifted up their voice saying, Jesus, now notice this, Master, have what? Say it with me. Mercy 
on us. Just like last week we talked about, that, that's how we're to pray. That, that's how you start every prayer. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Oh, oh, Lord, have mercy on us. See, when you had leprosy, you'd wrap your hands because your, your, your fingers and toes, they would start to lose the nerve endings in there. And then you would stub your hand. How many times a day you stub your foot? Any klutzes here? Any clumsy people here? Okay, a couple of you are? Okay, listen, even if you weren't, you, you know, you could bang your hand working, whatever. They would wrap them up because you'd bang a toe or a foot, you start to lose your fingers and toes. Your nose, your face would start to, to crumble off and peel off. And so, uh, have mercy on us. Take this torture away. Now, interestingly enough, leprosy um, is, a, is also a picture of sin. And in just a moment, it's going to be a picture of God's healing. Have mercy on us. Now, verse 14, when he saw them, he said to them. Now, when he saw them. You know, that's what you want. You want God's eyes on you, by the way. You want his eyes on you. Uh, when he saw them, you know, there's powerful looks. Who in your life, you know that they can look at you and their look is just powerful, right? Mom, dad, a grandparent, somebody. Man, they're, they're, they can look right through you, right? What was this look like? They had never been looked at like this before. You can guarantee that. Everybody that has looked on them since their leprosy has looked on them, you ready, with judgment. What have you done wrong? That's why you got leprosy. They've looked at them with pity, some with their sympathy, I'll pray for you, but at a distance. But nobody's ever looked at them like this. This was a look of healing. Because he looked at them and he said, go sow yourself to the priest. Now, what about that? Well, Leviticus 13 and 14 gave a whole prescription here that you're to check people if they have been cleansed of leprosy. Now, here's the only problem right now. You ready for this? There's only two records of people being healed of leprosy in all of Israel's history. Now, we know about the person in Matthew 8 we're not going to get to him yet chronologically yet. He's not there yet. Up until this point, only two people have been healed. You, you might recall Numbers 12, Miriam. You might want to write that down. Miriam was healed of leprosy. She complained. She got leprosy and she was healed on the same day. And then remember Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. He was healed of leprosy. But that's it. So these priests, most likely Anaphis and Ischipus and his sons, most likely um, they're... they're they're in office, and they've never had to check somebody to be healed. So if you got leprosy, if Ray got leprosy, my name was written in a book because I'm separated from people. So now you have how many lepers so far, if you're paying attention? How many? Ten. He now heals how many? Ten. Prior to this, no lepers have gone to the priest to be healed. Now ten are going to show up on their doorstep. Ten. And, and I'm sure they're looking through the book because they're coming, hey, we, we've been healed. We want to, my, my, my name is Louie. I, I, Louie, you've been healed? What? And, and, and Tom and Ray, and they start going through this list, and they're going, oh my goodness. Now, it was an elaborate process. Uh, it, it took eight days, actually. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to go into, but I'll give you kind of the clip notes. Uh, it would involve two doves, and one would be sacrificed, and the blood would be put on the other, and the other one would be released. Again, a picture of the blood of Christ has set us free. And so uh, this leprosy that was binding, that was damning to their life, um, they, they would perform this sacrifice, and they would then sit, they would go through a number of steps, and then for seven days, uh, they would sit and then reevaluate on the eighth day. And what they would do then is they would take the blood of the sacrifice and they'd put it on the ear to symbolize, even in salvation, how we're healed, how now we're hearing new instructions from the Word of God they would put blood on the thumb because now the hand is going to be used for the glory of God and salvation. They would put it on the big toe because now we're walking a new way in Christ. All of this symbolic of the Messiah to come. Uh, they would take the oil, the anointing oil, and they, they would anoint the ear. Uh, they, they would anoint the chest. And they would begin to anoint because it was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And it, it's just a picture of salvation. How leprosy is like sin to you and I, but we're saved by Christ by His blood and we've been set free from a debt sentence. 
And so all of this is taking place. Now go show yourselves to the priest. They're fumbling here. Oh my goodness, we've never checked anybody before. Now we don't just have one, now we have ten. But it gets better. Then, after they checked them out on the eighth day, guess what they had to do? They had to publicly restore them to society. What was that like? Hey, that carpenter from Galilee, he's a pretty good guy. (laughs) Okay. What was it saying, the fact that he healed these ten men? The Messiah is here. And the Messiah is bringing healing. When it comes to thankfulness now, we need to keep this in mind. Write this principle down. Sow thankfulness by using seeds of faith. Can you say that with me? Sow thankfulness by using seeds of faith. You know, when you have a need, you have to plant the seed. Can you say that with me? When you have a need, plant a seed. You know, when a farmer has a barren field, what does he do? Well, he doesn't complain about it. It's not producing any income. He doesn't complain about it. He doesn't even need to pray about it. You know what he got to do? He's got to plant a seed. When you have barrenness in your life, you got to plant a seed. See, today you might be thinking, man, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God to bring me a spouse. I'm waiting on God to give me a promotion. I'm waiting on God to open his door with a job. I'm waiting on God for my child. I'm waiting on God for this windfall. You know what God is saying? I'm waiting on you to plant a seed. I'm waiting on you to trust me. See, everything in life, relationships, a marriage, a business, a church, whatever it might be, everything starts with a seed. You must plant a seed. And you must plant a seed of faith. Nothing happens until a seed has been planted. Now, God wants you and I to know that he illustrates this through his son, Jesus Christ. Look what it says in John 12, 24. Why don't we say it together? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is teaching on sowing and reaping. He's teaching about his life. You know what the seed was? His life. And he was willing to lay his life down so that many, many could come to Christ. And we have to understand that if we're going to be a thankful people, it's not, let me just snap my fingers and I'm automatically going to be thankful. As you sow seeds of faith in your life, you will put yourself in a position to recognize the things that God has given to you. No, you can't just be hypnotized into being thankful. I know we get nostalgic and we want to pass the turkey around and the yams and every other things that may not be so healthy for us, but we want, to, we want to pass everything. All of a sudden, we're thankful for one day. It's not just about thankful nostalgia. It's understanding what Christ has done for us. And as we sow seeds of faith in our life, it puts us spiritually, emotionally, and mentally in a place of thanksgiving. See, many of us, you know, we're more concentrated. Man, I'm so frustrated. I'm so fatigued. You know what? You got to concentrate more on your faith. You got to take more steps of faith. Stop limiting God. Stop thinking we know it all. We want to understand. I got to sow a seed of faith. As I do that, that is going to reap thankfulness in my life and wholeness. That that is the will of God for me. Now look at the last part of this. Go show yourself to the priest. Now, can you say the rest of this with me? As they went, they were cleansed. Now, as they went. Now, don't miss that phrase. As they went. You know, what, were they, what was the conversation like? He says, go sell yourself to the priest, which meant at that moment they weren't healed just yet. They had to, in obedience, start their walk to the priests before they had their healing. Grammatically, in the Greek, it also conveys that same idea as it does in the English, that the healing didn't take place as they... St- he already spoke at Jesus, but it, it actually was in connection with their obedience. But even greater than that, um, it was something that was different than they were used to because what was the conversation like? Hey, I heard that he healed people with mud and sticks. How come we weren't healed? Maybe, you know, instantly, maybe they began to bicker between each other. We heard it happen this way. How has it happened that way? Sometimes we're like that with God. We hear what other God has done for other people. We want it exactly that way. Listen, God is going to do what he's going to do. It's never going to contradict his word, but he's going to do what he wants to do in his time. And it's always the right time at the right place. And uh, don't worry for a second. If he says, go and show yourself, go, go show yourself. Step out on faith. This is an act of faith. Go show yourself to the priest. And notice this, as they went, they were cleansed. The cleansing process, the healing process began. That by the time they got to the priest, 
there was no more leprosy. I bet as they were walking, they were going, man, you ain't so ugly. Neither are you. You know? Neither are you. What was that like? Because you hung, misery loves company. You know, interestingly enough, when something terrible happens, a crisis or an illness, all of a sudden, no, race doesn't matter any longer, right? If you have the same struggle. You know, you kind of, you kind of forge a, a friendship. Or you, you forge a bond over the turmoil. Economic status doesn't matter. Uh, neighborhood doesn't matter. None of those things matter. And for these lepers, we know, as we're about to read, that nine of them were Jews, and one of them was a Samaritan. And we know from John's Gospel and other places, as we study the Samaritans, uh, that Jews uh, didn't get along with Samaritans. But when you have leprosy, it don't matter if you're a Jew or a Samaritan. Now, you would think that all ten men, as we get ready for these next grouping of verses, would drop everything. And uh, they would do what they were told to do, and they would then, after they go show themselves to the priest, but after they did that, on the eighth day, that they would run to Jesus. Now, it says this, then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, okay? So circle that phrase, turn back. It, in, the, in the English language, like if you're, if you're going somewhere and then you turn, you know, in sports, we might call that a pivot. Your pivot foot in basketball, for example, um, it's a travel if you move both feet and you're holding the ball. But you're allowed to get the ball and pivot this way and pivot that way. You're allowed to do that. Uh, the Greek word here, turn back, gives us the understanding that he literally was going one way and he pivoted all the way full backwards. To, to change his directions. He didn't just look backwards. That's not enough. See, sometimes that's what we do. You know, God does things in our life. He tells us to do something and we look at it. Eh, no, nope, I'm going to keep going the way I'm going. No, it was a full obedient turn. He turned all the way and he went back to Jesus. And so it says he turned back and notice this. He did what? Praising God with a loud voice. He fell down on his face at Jesus, his feet. And notice this, giving him thanks. Now it says this, now he was a Samaritan. In other words, this is the most, unli this is the most unlikely. Out of ten people, this is the last person you'd expect perhaps. Okay, but this is a Samaritan. Why? Because the Jews, obviously the Jews, they're supposed to have you know, a, a firm grip on the law. Uh, obviously they, they should know verse and chapter, Leviticus 13 and 14 about leprosy. They've been healed of a death sentence. But nevertheless, it's the Samaritan who turns back. Now go ahead and circle the word healed. Interestingly enough, it means to cure, to heal, and to make whole. To make whole. Because... Literally, with leprosy, Dr. Luke could have used any other word. This is the doctor here. Doctor's in the house, Dr. Luke. He's literally telling you he's whole because he was apart. That's what, that, that's what leprosy, leprosy, you're coming apart. Dr. Luke says he's healed. In other words, he became whole again. Dr. Luke is giving you an update on his medical condition. Don't just say, oh, he's healed. No, no big deal. In other words, he's whole. Uh, the guys that had no fingers, they got their fingers back. The guys that had no ears, that had no nose, they got their little noses back. Maybe, you know, maybe one guy had a little nose, a little button nose. Maybe one guy had a big nose, okay? And he used to always be, hey, I got a big nose. You know what? God, thankful I got my big nose back. Perspective changes, right, when you're sick. All of a sudden, things have changed. And here it is. It, when he turned back, he was healed. They were healed. This man was healed. He's whole, Dr. Luke says. See, they didn't have to go to a clinic. He didn't have to go to rehabilitation. He was healed. It's an, this is an amazing miracle that's before us right now. And, but only one came back, though. And, 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 and it's as if, you know, the Holy Spirit kept, put that in there because God, Jesus doesn't like when God is robbed of His glory. Do you know that? Because all glory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It just does. Same thing in sports, whether you win or you lose. In life, whether you get this or you get that, it, all glory goes to the Lord. And so, as we begin to, to look at all of this, um, something comes to mind because only one came back. Uh, the other nine are like a bunch of users then. Okay? Let, write this principle down. Sow thankfulness by avoiding a user's mentality. Can you say that with me? Sow thankfulness by avoiding a user's mentality. You don't want to use people. You don't want to be a person in life that just does things so you could get something. 
Okay, and perhaps that's what's happened here. There's no doubt they had a terrible desperation. There's no doubt that they were in a pickle. We understand all that. But they had a user's mentality. And sometimes we're like that with each other. We do things because we're using people. I heard a story about a woman in Cleveland. She was dubbed by police as the cleaning fairy. And what she would do is she would break into homes and she'd clean the house and then she'd leave a bill. Leave a bill. They didn't know how to process it at first, the police. It kept happening. And then finally, they had, they had to go issue an arrest and call her. And they found her. She was actually shoveling snow for somebody else and left them a bill. And she was arrested. And he goes, listen, you can't break into people's prom- homes and property and, and cleaning. For, you know, you clean for them. That's nice. But then you're leaving them a $75 bill because people were saying, I didn't ask for this. And so she was dubbed as the cleaning fairy. Now, some of you are going, I don't care. Leave me the number of the cleaning fairy. <laughs> cleaning fairy, where can I find her, you know? Now, she was looking to drum up business. That's why she was doing it. Even though she was cleaning, she had a bill at the end of it. There's nothing wrong with getting paid, but you kind of have to agree with the person's house you're cleaning with first about that. She had a user's mentality. We're like that with people sometimes, and sadly, we're like that with God. You know, God, what, you know, God do this. I'm going to do this, oh God, and what are you going to do for me? Wait a minute, God has already done great things for you and I. We don't want to forget his blessings. And so I want to encourage you to do something called um, thankful thinking. And uh, you'll see that there in your notes, and there are three types of thankful thinking that I want to remind you of. There's reflective thinking. Uh, every day, by the way, You and I should have the practice before we get into our day, we want to pray, and then you want to think about your day. Who are you meeting with? What are you going to do? How can I add value to people? Um, You know, okay, I might have to watch my temper here. I'm going to need patience here. You know, you want to think about who you're meeting with, who you're encountering. But That helps you with your stress load, by the way. Everybody carries a stress load, but everybody carries it differently. And so having reflective thinking um, helps you. You're reflecting on the day before it starts, And you're also reflecting on blessings that God has given to you. You want to get in the habit of doing that. I'm reflecting. And then at the end of the day, you want to do the same practice. Reflect on what you did and reflect on what God has done for you in your life. Next, I want to tell you about creative thinking. Creative thinking. Get creative. I want you to do it. It's November, so might might as well. Get creative and do a detailed inventory of what God has blessed you with in your life. Do a detailed inventory of what God has blessed you with in your life. It's very healthy to do so. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, And then lastly, collaborative thinking. That's why, obviously, you always want to pray on your own, but every month the church has a prayer meeting. Guess what's this Thursday? The prayer meeting. And coming to prayer, we're not just lamenting, which is appropriate to do together. We're praying and lifting up. We're also coming to give thanks to God. We're going to be praising God this week. Okay, and so you come out this week, we want to give thanks, a portion of the prayer meeting, we'll be giving thanks to God. Collaborative, you want to get around other people and you want to be thanking God together. How many of us, well, you don't have to raise your hand for this because we don't cause any fights, but you might know some negative people. They're always bringing you down. Every, the sky's always falling. Everything's, there's never any, it's always terrible. And you know what? That, that kind of rubs off on you. Well, guess what else rubs off on you? Collaborative, thankful thinking. Be around people who can't wait to give God praise. Be around people, collaborate, and be around people who want to give God the praise and glory that He's due. There's a lot of selfish Christians out there. There's a lot of people who get their healing and forget to give glory to God. You know what? If if you're hanging out with those folks, here's some good advice. Get new friends. If you're one of those folks, okay, we're going to pray for you today, okay? You want to avoid a user's mentality. God doesn't want you living that way. A single mom, she raised three kids on her own, working two jobs. She hustled, yet she responsibly held down a loving and nurturing home. All three of her kids went on to college, and upon graduation, they all landed lucrative jobs. They did very well. As the years went on, mom got older, of course, and things started to break down, and she got sick, and she needed help. But all three of her kids, none of them lived far away, uh, all within driving distance, uh, maybe like an hour or two hours. None of them 
seemed to care about mom. The mom who sacrificed so much. The mom who, who went without. And then one day, uh, one of her kids was going through a box that was transferred from mom's basement to her now new bigger home. And she saw a note that mom had written to her when she was in school that must have slipped through uh, uh, one of her books. And it said this, no matter, it was during one of those tough times when money was tight, mom was working and hustling and whatnot. No matter what I go through, I will always remember that you are my blessing and I will always serve you. And at that point, tears started to flow down her daughter's face and she realized how very selfish she had been. And she immediately went to her mom and began to serve her. We don't want to have a user's mentality. We don't need to wait till we find a note. We've already been, give, we've been given a big note right here um, about to be thankful. And we want to be a thankful people. As you flip over your notes, take notice of this verse. A great verse to commit to memory. Psalm 103, verse 2. Why don't we say it together? Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He has done for me. Let that be your prayer this week, this month. Let all that I am praise the Lord. You don't want to be a complainer. You don't want to be, you know, Mr. Sour or Mrs. Sourpuss, okay? Mr. and Mrs. Sourpuss, they don't have a lot of friends, okay? So you don't want to be that way. You want to give thanks for the, to the Lord. And you know, the Bible says give thanks in all circumstances. Notice it doesn't say for all circumstances. Because there are bad things and terrible things that happen to us, but our, our praise is in the Lord, not in our problem. And so in all that we are, praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that he's done. And take inventory of your blessings. This is the heart of God for me and for you. And so as we close this parable, this parable in this passage right now, look what it says in the back end here. It says, then Jesus answered. So, so Jesus is taking inventory of all these things. Dr. Luke tells us that one came back, the other nine didn't. The other nine would be labeled as being somewhat ungrateful, if you will. And so Jesus is going to speak here. Now, anytime Jesus asks a question, it's not for his benefit because he's God. He already knows the answer. It's for the benefit of the hearer and for you and I with our 2,000-year vantage point. It says, we're not 10 cleansed. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a good question. He's not being sarcastic. Uh, this is for educational purposes. That's what I say when people think I'm sarcastic. I'm just speaking for educational purposes right now. This is a learning opportunity. We're not 10 cleansed. Now, circle the word cleansed. Caterizo in the Greek language. Can you say that with me? Caterizo. It means to make physically well. We're not 10 made physically well. Similar to the word, now again, this is a different Greek word than the word that we earlier read. Dr. Luke is, again, Dr. Luke's a doctor. He's, he's by far the most educated writer of the Gospels. I would say the most educated of all the books of the Bible, Okay, and so his vocabulary is expansive. Um, his diction is impeccable. And so he's, how he's wording this, um, and he's recording what Jesus said and how he puts it all together. You know, remember, we're going to study this in two weeks. You know, when Luke starts his gospel, he explains that we've organized these things in such a way. And he uses the word, ac the Greek word for acrobat, that like walking a tightrope, in other words, that we were very careful to organize that which has been recorded here, so that you can know that you know that you know that it's true. That this is not a made-up story. And so he records the words of Jesus now, and Jesus says that they were made physically well. Dr. Luke tells us made whole. Jesus says they're made physically well. And he says, where are the nine? So they were ten. They were ten. These guys were hanging out for a while. Now they're just nine. And it says, was not one found to return, uh, was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner. I love that. This is only one, this foreigner. In other words, the most unlikely of them all, Jesus is saying, the Samaritan, uh, shouldn't these Jews, these nine other Jews, shouldn't they be the first one online to come back and give thanks? Certainly they should, because they're, they're well versed in what, Moses' law says about leprosy and about all things spiritual pertaining to God. Does not their tradition, their rabbinic tradition, demand a better verdict of their healing? But nevertheless, 
Jesus said to him, the Samaritan, rise and go your way. Now underline go your way. That must have been music to his ears. See, what was the healing like? Just again, put yourself in their, their sandals, but this man right here, think about it for just a second. What was it like? Because the leprosy, now, uh, it's also known as Hansen's disease. There's about 5,000 people with it living in the United States, maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, 10, over 10 million in Asia with leprosy. Um, we can arrest it. We can't fully cure it. Um, we know about the, the extremities falling off, but there's itching, there's pain involved. Because the healing is instant, he had instant feeling of his nerve endings. What was that like to be able to move your fingers again? What was it like? Was he touching my, my nose, my face, my eyes? It was, what was he doing? How, how was that? But then how about this? After he did basically a check of himself that I'm okay. Okay, ten fingers, ten toes. Okay, I'm ready to go. Did he count them? Did he sing a song his mommy taught him? I don't know. But this much I do know, after he did a little investigation of himself because maybe he thought it was too good to be true, whatever happened, whatever humanly you would do in that situation, I don't know. But I know I would be counting ten fingers and ten toes and nose and singing songs and whatnot. It says then, he, Jesus told them, go your way. He was now given permission to live again. When you're saved by Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus Christ, when you're saved by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you could go away now. But you could go the way that God has willed for you. No longer are you an outcast. No longer are you separated and segregated. You are welcome because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this is all unfolding right before their eyes. What, what, what was Caiaphas thinking? Man, we never had to check this before. Now they're healed. But then here it comes, your faith. Because remember we said earlier, faith and thankfulness, you know, they're cousins. They, they go hand in hand. It's going to be hard to be a thankful person if you're a person who's Mr. or Mrs. Negative all the time, uh, Mr. Always the glass is half empty all the time, it's never going to work out in this and that, doom and gloom. No, you want to be a person of faith. Faith raises all boats in the harbor. Your faith has made you what? Well, whole. Now, circle that word. This is a different Greek word. It's suzo. Can you say that with me? Suzo. And it means, you'll see it right here. Say it with me. To save from suffering, salvation, and wholeness. The other nine, they were made physically well. Glory be to God. This man got a double healing. He was made physically well, and Jesus says he was made spiritually well. He's been made well. In other words, he's been saved. He came back. He returned praise to God because of his faith. He believed that the Messiah, he didn't use the Messiah. He came back to give praise. And Jesus, who could see all things, knows his heart. And he says, not only is this man physically well, this man is spiritually well. My friends, what good is it to get your physical healing if you never come to Christ? Listen, you get healed today, you're going to die from something else later on. Your soul needs to be saved. You need, yes, we might be coming to church to seek this and to seek that, but we need to be saved by Jesus Christ. Leprosy, the healing of leprosy was a picture of the Messiah's healing. Nine went to go do what they wanted to do, but one came back and was made well. Write this last principle down. So thankfulness by always considering the big picture of my blessings. Can you say that with me? The big picture wasn't that they just got their fingers back. The, the big picture wasn't just that they can go back into society. The big picture was that to display and to declare that Jesus Christ has power over sickness and death. And He still does today. He still does today. All of Each and every one of us that are here today, you might be going, oh, I never had leprosy, don't apply to me. Well, you know what? Yes, you did. If you've come to Christ, first of all, everybody's had a sin leprosy in their life. Everybody has. 
Everybody's been physically healed, by the way. How do we know that? How many of you have ever been sick in your life? Anybody? Everybody has. Everybody's been sick. And you're here today because God brought about a healing in your life to bring you here. Praise Him for that. Give Him thanks for that. Give Him thanks for every breath in your lungs. You're here today. What He's taken you through. A trial, an ordeal. Whatever it might be, what you're going through right now. Always give thanks to God. Always. Count your blessings one by one. You do it by praising Him. You know, um, next Thursday, not this Thursday, but next Thursday on the 28th, we'll celebrate Thanksgiving. We know that the tradition dates back to around the 1620s, but the official holiday didn't come into existence and observance until 1863 by which U.S. President? Abraham Lincoln, okay? Uh, Lincoln issued a proclamation um, to set aside the last Thursday of November as a day for giving thanks. Uh, that was actually right in the middle, interestingly enough, of the American Civil War. Yet to despite uh, the nation's struggles, President Lincoln recognized that there was so much to be grateful for. In fact, he wanted all Americans to join in gratitude, and so he wrote this, and I brought it with me up here to close with, and listen to these things. Share this with your children, by the way. No human counsel, Lincoln's, Lincoln said, hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do hereby invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart the observance of the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heaven. You ever wonder why America is so blessed? Oh, we got ingenuity. We got initiative. We got the American spirit. Oh boy, we do. We also have some other things that aren't so good to talk about. You want to know why certain people oppose people of faith, people who try to lead in faith? because it scares them to death because that comes from the pits of hell. This country has been blessed by Almighty God and may us never forget that. God has blessed us. Let us always be thankful. Uh, whether it is the Great Depression, uh, whether it is attacks on our own soil, uh, whether it is financial crisis or medical crisis or natural disaster, uh, let us always remember the big picture of whatever blessings we have. And America has had an illustrious past. Uh, we are enjoying our present, but if we are going to have a future, we must never forget so great a salvation and the provider of such. It is vital to our existence as a country. And you could see it now, whether it's in the schools, whether it's with our laws, uh, whether it's with uh, opposing forces uh, from the womb to the grave, we see the attacks that come from the pits of hell. Let us continue to rise up with voices of praise. Remember King Jehoshaphat? In 2 Chronicles 20, I wrote to you about this in one of the devotions this week. Remember, the opposing forces were coming, and what did they do? They prayed and they fasted. And then what was told for them to do as we close? What was told for them to do? Uh, you go out and you praise. You praise. And while you praise, you watch the Lord's victory. You stand in your thanksgiving and your praise. And I want to encourage you today, to always stand in your praise and in your thanksgiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what's going to bring the wholeness you've been waiting for. That is going to bring the contentment, the peace that surpasses all human understanding that comes from the throne of Almighty God that's second to none. The Lord Jesus Christ Perform this miracle. He put all of Israel on notice. Never before were lepers cleansed like this. And it was to say that the Messiah is here. Do you know that the Messiah has come? Do you know that He's got healing in His voice, in His hands, in His look, in His touch? 
my friends, sow a seed of faith. Get rid of that user's mentality, that prosperity gospel garbage, that entertainment business Christianity. Get rid of all of that. Be humble and seek the Lord. And always consider the big picture of what He's given you. The Apostle Paul said that to the churches in the region of Ephesus, reminding them of their blessings. Ephesians 5.20, why don't we close and say it together. Always giving thanks to God, the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? I pray you do. I pray you receive it this morning. I pray that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And um, I, if you've never asked Christ into your heart, tomorrow is not promised to you. I got news for you. Ten minutes from now is not promised to you. But heaven is. You can't get to heaven on somebody else's ticket. Oh, my wife comes to church. My husband comes to church. Or, or my friend comes to church. Or my daughter, my niece, my grandmother. I gave $100. Good for you. It's only by the healing of salvation through Jesus Christ on the cross that you could be saved. I pray you know that today. If you don't, I want to lead you in a prayer. With every head bowed and eye closed, very important right now, if you've never asked ex- Christ into your heart. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask that we all stand right now. Why don't you just stand to your feet right there in your place. Just repeat this prayer right now. Uh, no matter where you are, seated in the sanctuary today, is standing in the sanctuary today. It's a time of reverence, so let's just be respectful of the Lord, but repeat this prayer right to God in the quietness of your own heart. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. That he died for my sins. And rose from the dead. I ask him into my life. I repent of my ways. And I choose to follow you. With all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, we would love to know about it. You're welcome to, to let us know that after service. Even while we sing this song, uh, the altar is open. If you want to come and pray, that's appropriate as well. Let me just pray for all of us right now. Our Father, our God, we thank you for the blessings you've given to us. Lord, I pray for those today who have any type of disease or infirmity, any family member of somebody they love that does, oh God, Lord, that needs healing, we thank you that you do heal, oh God. Uh, but Lord, we know there's a greater healing, salvation. But we ask, oh God, for your mercy to be upon us right now. I pray for those who are struggling, God, in their mind, their heart, those who are downtrodden, oh God, those who are suffering with addiction. God, we pray that your healing hand would break whatever chains are holding us down. We thank you, oh God, for the mercy you've shown to us in the past. And in faith, we know and we cry out for mercy to come. We thank you, O oh God, and we commit these prayers in the merciful name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.